didn't. After Ardell and I returned from the farmer's market yesterday morning, I took a Bible, a few books, and my laptop to the shed in the backyard to begin typing this sermon. I much prefer to be polishing a sermon rather than starting to type on a Saturday morning, but some weeks are just like that. I built that shed a few years ago to house the lawnmower, bicycles, various tools I didn't want to have to haul up from the basement each time they were needed. But while our daughter was riding out the early months of the pandemic with us at home, we made other arrangements for the stuff and turned that shed into a little office slash guest room of sorts. Kate was chief decorator. The walls and the tin roof remained uninsulated. A piece of plywood laid across the rafter ties holds her old screen printing screens and some books. There's a Mavis Staples concert poster tacked up next to a window made of four glass blocks left in the yard by the last owners of the house. Kate's frighteningly convincing newspaper collage that's of Audrey Hepburn's face was glaring at my back as I typed this, and a rectangle of slate that my grandmother painted a little white church with birches on a riverbank in the foreground is leaned against the wall in front of me. It's actually a surprisingly pleasant little space. Now, there are actually plenty of other places in the house to type, But as I said, it was Saturday morning, and I had a sermon to come up with post-haste. I needed a space where I might be surprised by a thought I hadn't quite had before, or at least a space I might describe to you, and maybe even by the time I finished, find myself 300 words into the sermon I sat down to write that morning. Anyway, I started typing yesterday. But I had been thinking for much of the week on that wonderful exchange we just heard from 2 Samuel between David, the prophet Nathan, and Yahweh. It's a conversation, at least in part, I think, about what makes places holy, which I'm coming to believe is always at least one part surprise. King David, we read, has just settled into his house. He'd settled in right after last week's reading in which he danced ecstatically and apparently somewhat scantily clad before the Ark of the Covenant as it made its way back into Jerusalem after being lost in battle with the Philistines. The dancing unsettled David's wife, Michal, who was embarrassed that her husband, the king, no less, was, well, here are our words from last week in case you missed them, uncovering himself before the eyes of his servants' maids as any vulgar fellow might shamelessly uncover himself. David says, well, I'm sorry, but I was dancing before God, and you actually have no idea how contemptible I plan to become before I'm finished. (laughs) That's not a direct quote, but he did use the word contemptible, which will be definitely an appropriate adjective for David as his story unfolds. Not for the dancing so much as that tendency toward infidelity and betrayal and murder and such. But I digress. David broke into that ecstatic, cringeworthy dance because an ancient holy object has made its way back into the city. And when he settled back into his own house of cedar, he wondered aloud to Nathan if it was right that the ark of God was housed in a tent. Now, if you have an annotated Bible there's a good chance you'll find a floor plan of the tabernacle and its courts. If you turn back to Exodus 25, I recommend it to you when you get home. This is the tent to which David refers, and it and its furnishings are all described in great detail in Exodus. The tent's 100 cubits by 50, a cubit being about a foot and a half. There's an altar built of acacia wood and a bronze basin inside the entrance. Further in is the tabernacle that holds a lamp and a table and a small altar for incense, all of which are overlaid with pure gold and arranged in front of a curtain that hides the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark itself held the stone tablets of the law. It too was made of acacia wood overlaid with gold. Golden rods slipped through four gold rings so an exiled people could carry the Ark with them as they moved. And atop it was something called the mercy seat. Two cherubim made of hammered gold faced each other on either side. And the seat is the empty chair of Yahweh, the place where the God of mercy would be 
if God were somewhere in particular. I thought it could be helpful to at least have a sense of what the tent was to which David alluded in that conversation with Nathan. It wasn't exactly a faded canvas model from the army surplus store. Everything about it suggested this odd combination of sacredness and portability. Now David was in Jerusalem, hopefully to establish an everlasting kingdom as all kings hope. So, he says, how about we make a proper and permanent house for God? Now sometimes prophets tell kings that they've lost all touch with reality. But Nathan said David should carry on through with this plan. But God came to Nathan that night and said, please go tell David I never actually asked for a house of cedar. Tell him what I want is to make a house from him, a household of the children of this shepherd boy I chose to be king. Now this might seem like the time to say the thing people always say, especially when we're stuck in our homes during pandemics. The church isn't the building, it's the people. But the story doesn't actually turn completely away from all these wild and splendid particulars. Remember, the Ark of the Covenant is still going to inhabit the not-so-shabby digs described above until David's son Solomon builds an actual temple in Jerusalem. What God seems to be telling David is just not to forget what holy things and holy places are for. The great scholar of religion, Mircea Eliade, wrote a book called The Sacred and the Profane. And in it, he insisted that religion begins with the moment in which the sacred, or God, breaks through into human experience. Hierophany is the term he uses. That experience is one that can never be adequately put into language, nor can the God who has broken in upon us. But he said what humans consistently do after such an encounter is not to say, wow, God must be everywhere. What we do in response to sacred encounter is where we take off our shoes because the ground we're standing on suddenly feels different from other ground. We stack up stones to mark this particular place where that happened. Maybe we paint the front doors red. After an encounter with the holy, Iliade says humans no longer see all the space around them as homogenous. Some places and moments are different, charged with a presence, or were once charged with a presence that sets them apart. And acknowledging the world as so is one ancient way we orient ourselves within it. Now, idolatry is believing that the made thing or the place itself is the God. It's believing that the whole of the sacred is contained in that material object. The Hebrew scriptures are this story of a struggle to let go of idolatry and to come to trust the God who cannot be contained in a tent or even described with a name. But a God who is still encountered in strange and surprising ways among their neighbors, in their cities, among ornate furnishings for a tabernacle, or maybe at a bush that burns and will not be consumed. Which means those neighbors and furnishings and burning bushes can be as much a kind of language with which we can reach toward God as are the words of scriptures and creeds. Why else would you carry stone tablets in a little golden house through the wilderness for all those years? In fact, maybe if not the opposite, at least an antidote to idolatry is this capacity for divine surprise, an openness to the next place God might surprise us. I actually hesitate to reduce these stories to a clear and practical lesson for our lives, even if you have every right to expect that from a sermon. The wild details of the Bible do a kind of irreducible work on us, I think, like the quirky furnishings for a garden shed or a church or a city block that bring them and us to life furnishings for a world that doesn't seem so homogenous and so stuck, but maybe a place still ripe for surprise and strangeness, still ripe for the holy. But I actually need to believe in such a world pretty badly right now. I need to get a little less stuck in my thinking 
and opened a little more to the possibility of being surprised by God. And I think I need people and places and things in my life that will help me do that, don't you? It might seem like what would open us best to surprise would, be, would need to be strange and unfamiliar, but I don't think it does. Our worship tradition, our, our hymns and organ pipes and tower bells, our chalices, investments, and wobbly brass crosses, I think they're all more like idols if they only settle us reassuringly into the stability of the past. They're meant to be objects carried through the wilderness of so many centuries to startle us into a present hope that God can make something new, not only of us, but of this world. They are the relics and reminders of lives and times in which God has done just that. Surprise set David to dancing that day in the streets before God's fancy, ancient, empty chair. And that surprise is what God kept alive a day later by telling the same ecstatic king not to go build him a house, but to see the house of God as all those generations of people yet to come. So it could be that it's time to put our bodies to work again at worship after a long, long time apart, coming together and continuing that procession into Jerusalem with sacred, beautiful things, each dedicated to God, each made to reorient our minds and bodies to God. Or it may be we need to let the gilded things lose their grip on our imaginations a bit and consider all the people in the years to come and imagine them as what it means to see as a place where God truly dwells. More than likely, it will always be some mixture of the two, which is why we'll always need other Christians to help our liturgies and our lives stay attentive and open to where God is moving among us to who God is calling us to be, to the ways in which our life together can keep us from settling or despairing that the way things are is just the way things have to be, and giving those lives over to the God who is eternally capable of a resurrection-scale surprise. Amen.